You're not listening to Sanity at the Movies, WandaVision Addendum, Before You've Heard the Real Thing Edition. So let me just explain this. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Nathan. That's Jake. Hey. That's Ben. Hello. We review movies on Sanity at the Movies. Bring a little sanity to your movie watching experience. Christian sanity. The only kind, really, when you think about it. Now, here's the thing. A week ago or so, I think exactly a week ago, we recorded a big long thing on WandaVision, which you're about to hear. But then we realized, wait a second, they're going to release more episodes of WandaVision, and that will maybe affect what we have to say about it. So in, a, in this weird, mind-bending, worthy of the hit show WandaVision itself, this weird mind-bender of a podcast, you're going to hear us talk right now real quick about episode four. And then you're going to travel back into the idyllic world of us talking about episode one through three. And you'll hear me explain a bunch of things about what we're doing, which is basically that if you want to hear the rest of our thoughts about episodes five through eight, you go to patreon.com forward slash sanity at the movies and plunk down some sweet cash and you'll be able to hear that. And hear it in or close to real time yes insofar as we are able we will try and get those out on friday or saturday like what me and jake did with the mandalorian the mandalorian so this is kind of weird you're you're gonna have to wait five ten minutes however long it takes us to talk about episode four to get our our big picture thoughts on wandavision a show that i think we all like yeah, yeah. but let's talk about episode four guys what do you think about that episode four you can see the bind we're in, folks, because if, if, yeah, if you know the show, like episode four kind of. Okay, so the change of p- point of view mm-hmm. is a pretty standard bit in a mystery box type of Yes, yes, yes. Show. Lost did it. Lost did it. Actually, Lost did it multiple times. First, they mm-hmm. did it with the tail section, and then they did it with the others. Or they did it with Desmond in the hatch. I mean, they did it. Like, yeah, at least three times just off the top of my head. Well, and they also did it in some sense every episode when it was like, Luck used to be a guy that did boring things. Yeah. Or with, (laughs) and then when they went to the flash forwards, they did it again. Right. That kind of thing, you know, it's a fun idea that what's fun about a mystery box show is, hey, look, more mysteries. Hey, look, we're pulling the rug out from under you or we're swapping perspectives or something like that. But this was more like, Wow, it's really interesting having the rug pulling pulled out from me, and then the Marvel executives come along and they're like, "Let me shove a rug under your feet." <laughs> like, I want to make sure you're standing on a rug. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the best the best way to frame this episode is, "Hey, we want you to know that you're actually in a Marvel movie that extends over nine episodes. We want to come back and assure you that." Everything that we're doing is of a piece with the MCU that you know and love. And we've got some new characters that are actually kind of B characters, but for our purposes, they're going to be maybe our protagonists. And we want to introduce you to them and give everybody a moment to catch their breath. And since a lot of kids are involved, we're just going to spell things out for them so that the kids who have been tracking or not tracking the first three episodes are going to feel like, okay, I get it now. That That's the best spin that you could possibly put on it. I think that that's such a good spin that I can't really argue with that, <laughs> except for to say that I hate it. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, it's fine. Whatever. It's, 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 it's fine for a kid's show, which is basically, I guess, what this is. Except that it also, I mean, the, the argument against that, it has some of the least kid-friendly stuff in all of the MCU. And especially this particular episode, just in terms of straight up shock horror. Mm-hmm. Like, hmm. yeah, has the MCO ever done a jump scare like that with Vision? Have, have they actually done that before? No. no, I don't think so. And certainly not on that level. Like, that was yeah. super creepy <laughs> relative to anything else you could, you've could seen in the MCU. The way they played the blip for horror instead of, you know, Spider-Man played it for comedy. Right. Mm-hmm. And they played it for sort of existential horror. I liked that I a lot, oh, by I the way. Too. But I thought that was, that that was, was cool. It was really cool. That was great. It was really well yeah. done. It was also horrifying mm-hmm. in its own way. But then coming back then with a horrifying vision zombie and all the implications of that. Like, does she actually have his corpse in there and she's trying to Frankenstein she's it manipulating somehow? manipulating yeah. his corpse. Like, if that's what's happening, like... <laughs> 
So it's just like, yeah, it's just weird. Well, it almost uh, felt, when you put it that way, it feels even more cynical. They know that there's like these dumb kids watching that need it spelled out for them. Two plus two equals four. Uh, two, yeah. But also, Jake, Nathan, Ben, we're going to give you two really cool things yeah. that we're going to throw at you to make you be like, okay, okay that was, at, on reflection, that was boring and stupid and a waste of time, but. Well, they gave you two cool things. Yeah, but and, and that's just like, I almost reject that even more. Like, if you just want to say, we're, we're going to do a kid's show now. It's a kid. Sorry if we made you think this was going to be some David Lynchian, like, existential suburban nightmare. It's a kid's show. You know, come on. It's Marvel. That's one thing. But to try and, in any way, split the difference, split the difference is yeah. just kind of obnoxious. I, I, well, I felt like, well, what did I expect? Marvel's going to marvel. You know, yeah, Marvel's gonna marvel. <laughs> Marvel's gonna marvel, and they're gonna give me like, hey, by the way, do you remember that we do this competent, bantery, really meat and potatoes storytelling thing where we tell you everything that's going on, mm-hmm. and we have like some kind of half decent scripts, and there's a plot, and we just tell you what's going on. As we we do th- we do that. We're, we're not afraid to expose it in case you forgot. Yeah, right. It's like, oh yeah, that's that is what you do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. with great characters like Agent Wu and <laughs> Darius. Agent Wu is fun. You know what? I, I will say, I actually don't remember Agent Wu. Who, who, what is he Where from? Where was he from? I recognize him. But... The Wasp. Oh okay. no! And yeah. I think he was also. I think I saw that he was also a character in Agents of Shield or something like that. Okay. I, and so I think I think he was like a side character in Agents of Shield that. They pulled in. That they pulled in for okay. fans into Ant-Man and the Wasp. And then they liked how it worked in I, both places. This plan would be characters, right? It's, well, and so I, I think probably the I softball joke that. was probably a joke for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. people. Right. Huh. Certainly the card trick was a joke. And I think that's an Ant-Man and the Wasp joke. Huh. Yes, I rem- I have a very vague... Uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp like, almost just doesn't exist. I remember a giant salt shaker... Uh, and such a boring movie. It is so boring, but well, it, it. This is why Marvel actually needs to be TV because characters like Ant Man and the Wasp, even with Paul Rudd, they don't belong on the silver screen so much as on the. Paul Rudd got his start on the small screen in, in the Freaks and Geeks, if I'm not mistaken. And as far as I'm concerned, he could stay right there on the small screen. <laughs> uh, if you took some of the Ant Man and the Wasp stuff and ideas and conceits and did a show with it it could be a fun little show it could be in a, a way show. that it, it doesn't justify being some blockbuster event mm-hmm. no yeah. you'd have to have a really talented director to pull off a blockbuster event and they had a really talented director who they disagreed with creatively because he wasn't going to do a typical marvel movie who was that I, that I, was edgar wright the Shaun oh, of the dead director yeah who's a quirky british guy who likes so to play with genres with the ant-man franchise. with ant-man yeah, no, i forgot Ant-Man. about that he yeah. would have been wonderful for ant-man oh yeah he would have been very clever and funny and weird and it just would not have fit the typical marvel formula i mean i i haven't read that much about the split but that's easy to imagine i uh, sort of just maybe uncharitably i assume everything that's kind of funny about the first Ant Man, like when they're, they're having the epic battle, and then it's got uh, suddenly on a Thomas the Tank, and you realize right, it's just this right, dorky right. thing. That feels very Edgar Wright, that's, kind of that's hot fuzz, Wright, Shaun of yeah. the Dead style. Yeah, his his wry sort of British <laughs> sense of humor. Yeah, although I really hated Edgar Wright's and last the most movie. That you're going to be able so. to get creatively in Marvel. You're going to have to play it like James Gunn or Taika Waititi. So you're going to have to commit to split the difference. Yeah, what I like yeah, about be uh, able to be an auteur, mm-hmm. you know, really do your own thing. You're going to be able to color a little bit outside of the lines that they set for you. That's right. Not too far. I think both of those guys are talented at figuring out how to exactly to split the difference. I mean, Gunn does it just by bringing his own sensibility to the perfunctory violence, which, like it or lump it, we we don't have to litigate that today. But mm-hmm. he's a very talented guy and a sicko. That's I guess the, yeah, the that's, that's, that's my that's my the <laughs> yeah, judgment of my litigation on that guy. Yeah, he is. And then uh, what T take uh, what TD or yeah, however you yeah, say his name. He, he knows how to be irreverent enough that they're not going to cancel his. They're not going to remove him. <laughs> well, he feels more like a true split the difference. Like okay, here's your standard fifteen minutes of action. We're going to make sure we get that in. You know, uh-huh. get it. Get a few minutes of Thor jumping around and Hulk and stuff. Every every reel, but. In between that, as, as long as we deliver that, and then in between it, we can kind of just do what we want. And what we want is to just be completely goofy and irreverent. And that's pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. You know, the interesting thing about Thor Ragnarok, this is completely off the beaten track. That movie to me 
captures an 80s vibe so much better than so many things you like wonder woman 1984 or stranger things yeah like that movie actually huh. just with the vhs inspired credits and the synth score and just the way a little that, bit of glam makeup for jeff goldblum oh and, yeah well and for what's her face kate blanchett it, it, it's not trying to recreate an 80s movie it just feels like it has the sensibilities of of an 80s movie it's kind of corny and but also in the 20 teens yeah but also in the 20 teens yeah that's part of what's so f- so fun about that movie it's a good movie I should see it again someday. It took me a second viewing to appreciate it. Yeah, I, we came out of I, that together. I and remember I loved it and you hated it. Uh, I was indifferent. I think. Were you? Yeah, you were actually at that viewing. <laughs> I was like, ah, write a script for once, fellas, and Jake was like, yay, fun, and you were <laughs> like, I was like the most fun Marvel movie ever. That was, that like, was awesome. I was <laughs> like, it was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Marvel should have standards that are higher than good for a Marvel movie. It's like, but it was great for a Marvel movie, and we like Marvel movies. What's wrong? Okay. I don't get it. All right. Well, speaking of that, Marvel TV shows should have standards that are better than great for a Marvel TV show. Uh, I, I really did. I, I want to not just be an old man on a porch ranting against a cloud that's going by. You should put your cane down then first. Yeah. I, I'm just going to put my cane. You know what? For a Marvel TV show, whatever, I'm sure kids appreciate having everything spelled out, but if I am allowed to approach this just from a subjective, personal, this is how I felt about it perspective, I really didn't like this for the, I found this, actually, I, what I was going to say originally is I am a, I've always been an apologist of that one girl, Darcy, I think, is that the character's name or the actress's yeah. name? The character is Darcy, the actress is Kat. Kat Dennings or whatever. Huh. Den- Dennings. Dennings, yeah. I've, I, I thought she was funny. I actually secret have a soft spot in my heart for Thor The Dark World, which is this really stupid, boring I movie. I like but Thor The Dark World. Yeah, it's kind of fun, right? It, it's, a, it's a fun movie. It tries to do a bunch of the silly stuff and actually kind of succeeds. Yeah, it plays it with a much straighter face than Ragnarok. But, right, right. But it's the only one. That first Thor movie is kind of a bummer. That's real boring. But hmm. um, Or I thought so. People seem to like that one I better like than I it, did. Okay, but I like Thor Dark World better. It was more fun. Yeah. It had more stuff. You got to see Loki really go for it. It, and the, well, the, the first, actor. The first, yeah, that's that's Tom Hiddleston's best Marvel movie, I think, is Dark World. Yeah, he does. It's, some, it's too he bad. Does, he does some awesome true. stuff in there. Yeah. The, I mean, the first one, they were still trying to crack the code for other characters and they brought Bran on and he does give a, a nice little sacrificial heroic arc mm-hmm. that yeah. if you're willing to go there and just shut your brain off, it's okay. Yeah, my problem was my, my brain was on and I was just like, Branna, like let's just let Branna be more Branna. Like, yeah, you, you know, Branna can be so much Branna, Branna, yeah. Brannery, <laughs> Brannor. Well, that's, that's the thing with all these Disney properties, though. Like, you know, you bring Guy Ritchie in for Aladdin, and then tell him he can't be Guy Ritchie. What the heck? Well, that's why you do have to give some props to somebody like James Gunn, who's either just good in a pitch meeting, or I don't know what his secret is, yeah. but he's figured out how to bring some real James Gunn. I mean, I almost wish it wasn't James Gunn because he is so twisted that it's like, let's let's actually curb this guy. But yeah. you do have to appreciate a real visionary. That's weird. Yeah, you do wonder how he did that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think what he did was... I think part of it was timing. Marvel was getting tired. Well, and he had a property that nobody cared about. I mean... That's yeah, right. and that's so they right. were willing to, willing to burn it. And, and that's why they should have been willing to do the same thing with Ant- Ant-Man. Right. And it's another property that nobody cares about. And you cast Paul Rudd. If you're gonna okay, you cast Paul Rudd. People are gonna come out because they like Paul Rudd because he's just a likable guy. Let let somebody take a risk so that it has a chance to blow up the way that Guardians did. Yeah. If Guardians flops, Guardians can disappear and nobody cares. If Guardians blows up, you know you've got this whole other world out there that you can yeah enrich the MCU with. Invaluable to them now. Yeah. Well, that's all they have moving forward. You, and, and then, you know, letting Taika do what he did with Thor. Okay, now we've got space. And space is now legit because Branagh and whoever else couldn't give us a credible Asgard. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, Asgard was always a bummer in those movies. We failed at staking some territory out in space throughout the whole first phase of mm-hmm. the MCU. And now Guardians, and we could put Thor out there. And now we have space and earth and that's cool yeah. yep a little a little bit like america does with space force proceeding under the biden administration <laughs> as jen Saki reminded us just uh, the day before this recording uh, it's more like what 
Elon Musk is into and what Jeff Bezos stepped down from the sea uh, from Amazon to do, I think. That's my suspicion. To huh. explore space. Well, do you want to hear my crazy theories? Sure. Okay. This is Sandy at the movies, not Sound of Sanity, but here, here are my crazy theories. All right. E- Elon passed Bezos as the most wealthy man in the world, and he's been pressing hard and harder still. He is in space, and he's got his Mars project and other things. He's also been pressing for Neuralink, which is that whole like encoded, embedded, and trying to teach monkeys to play video games with their minds and things like that. Right. What if the future of space exploration is, I don't know what the right word is, androids? Mm-hmm. Controlled, Neuralink, like, okay, like in the in the Guardians movie, you, you, you're controlling spaceships. Like I'm one of the yellow people. Yeah, like mm-hmm. the yellow people are controlling mm-hmm. spaceships with their, they're sitting in there, in there and they're playing an arcade game. So I'm on Earth, but I can feel and see and everything that my automated monkey in space is exactly. feeling and seeing. Uh-huh. Something like that. So that's minimal risk. I don't know. I think that may be part of Elon's. But I think that the reason Bezos stepped down as CEO of Amazon yesterday is because he needs to get back on top. He is going to redirect all of his time and energy to to space. The tie would be, all right, so here's, uh, you made random observations on our movie podcast, so I'll just keep going, Jake. One tie would be, I listened to Scott Adams uh, last week, and he was talking about how Elon Musk and others of his ilk are super geniuses, and they are devoting themselves to saving the world, and they're the only ones who can, who can save us from climate change. Whatever you think about that, that's what, that's what Scott Adams says, and you know, through going to space and through whatever. And Elon Musk has this idea that he's responsible for taking our species to the next level, whatever that is. Right. And so he's going to evolve us or push us forward. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so, and so these, this really does tie to the Marvel movies, which is about these gods basically mm-hmm. who save right. us. And that's what these guys think they are. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, maybe, I don't know. Scott Adams thinks that's what they are. It's practically worshipful the way he talks of them. I guess that's what we want as fallen men is, uh, these guys to be our gods. Yeah, well, Tony Stark. I mean, Tony Stark was unapologetically a great character because he was a, hu- a flawed human being that could transcend his limitations through right. technology. I mean, he was actually the most yeah. godlike yeah. among all of us because yeah, he just right. built it. When, when he had a problem with his heart, it was just like, oh, yeah, I could have solved that if I had just given myself to it. That's right. And now I have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, ge- I guess I need a master medicine now. Oh, I guess I need a master robotics oh i guess i need to master time travel yeah well and you know depending on what they want to do with paying rdj's salary it's quite possible that tony stark mastered living forever one way or another it's it's some some conscious or his uh his consciousness to i mean you already have an uploaded consciousness in the mcu that's already happened Right, uh, the Nazi guy. The, the, yeah, so the Nazi guy did it. If the Nazi guy can do it with some tapes and old tech. Oh, that guy. That's yeah. right. If the Nazi guy can do it with some tapes and old tech. Surely Tony had something up his sleeve. There's no question Tony could have done it if he wanted to. If he wanted to. Yeah. I think whether he wanted to is really just depends on... How well the next phase of the MCU goes and how much, how many truckloads of cash are willing to back up to... <laughs> well, I was. Ju- store, right? I, I'm sure with Luke Skywalker appearing on Mandalorian, we've all had to think, what's the biggest flex? And I think most people have, la- you know, for Man- for WandaVision or one of these shows to do. I think most of us have landed on Patrick Stewart or, or Ian McKellen, Ian and that's Cohen, a big yeah. flex and a much cheaper flex than than, than Robert Downey, Robert Downey, Downey Jr. Jr. Yeah. But yeah. it is interesting to speculate on what's what's the biggest flex they could possibly do in one of these shows. Maybe Chris Evans. I know there's been talk about them trying to get evans back yeah. um, and it feels like if evans was going to come back he'd probably be quite happy to get you know 20 million dollars to do a cameo in a tv show as opposed to <laughs> right <laughs> having to come do another movie that yeah. he kind of low-key just doesn't like doing chris evans should just play the villain and knives out sequels they should just he should, <laughs> he should, keep coming back he should just keep coming back as a, <laughs> such perfect, petulant brat. as a petulant brat yeah well Chris Evans and Ryan Johnson can go make movies together for the rest of time for all I care. And there'll be two people I don't like making movies that I probably do. Maybe Ryan Johnson could make a Captain America movie. I bet Chris Evans would come back for that. I bet he would. To talk about a deconstruction of Captain America. Uh, oh, man, that guy. Um, suck all the life out of your soul in yeah. one viewing. 
Well, guys, we have to get to the other part of this podcast where we travel back oh. in time and hear our thoughts. So maybe we should wrap this up. Uh, my thoughts on the fourth episode were that I get why they did it. I found it very demoralizing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure they'll probably bounce back from it just fine in the rest of the episodes. Yeah. I mean, I think that episode is probably why it's nine instead of eight. Yeah. Well, and if they wrote a great eight, se- eight episode arc and then some slimy executive said, you have to put in the lame episode where you explain everything. People are dumb and they're not going to get it and we got to keep the kids. Yeah. So the fat sheep will understand what's going on. Even, <laughs> even though, even though everything that this episode told us, we already could we already kind of, knew, we already basically. knew basically. Hey, well, the, the only other thing that creatively might've made this feel justified is if they had an eight episode arc, they had it all out and then they realized we had this fun idea or idea we thought was fun of using these B characters that we, n- we never established because we were stuck in TV world. Mm-hmm. And so when it came down to the final episode or the final two or three episode arc. You're suddenly supposed to care about Monica you're Rambo. You're supposed to care or... about Monica Rambo and Jimmy Woo and Darcy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And only one of those that people might on the whole recognizes Darcy. So we've got to do something to establish these characters. And like, okay, it feels lame, but... We got to stick something in there early enough to establish them so that the payoffs work and the, and the plot works and people aren't just stuck on Wanda's the villain, but also the only likable character here. Right. Well, it's too bad. I mean, I wish they could have just saved some things. Like, I don't need to know who the beekeeper is this earlier. You know, it's just, it's more fun. Yeah, that was too bad. They, They really just took away from the whole Twin Peaks kind of feeling of the first three episodes. And I thought that was sad. But Maybe they'll get some of it back. But no matter what kind of creepy things we see in the next ones, it's going to be like, well, I know that's just... I know. And I already did know that, but it's nice not to have it colored <laughs> in too. Anyway, now let's travel back to a time when we were very enthusiastic about this show, which I think we still basically are, but no. we really like those first three episodes a lot. So now, folks, I will take you to a magical period where... I'm going to be explaining, I think, in great detail, the conceit of us even watching WandaVision and how you can sign up for Patreon. And then we're going to be talking about those three episodes. So here we go. Back in time. Let's use the time stone. Ring. You're now listening to Sanity at the Movies, Marvelous Edition. We're talking WandaVision, everybody. Just this once. We're talking WandaVision on this side of patreon.com forward slash sanity at the movies we'll be reviewing every episode of wandavision there in great detail as we like to do but you'll have to go to the patreon to get that so starting right out of the gate 2021 starting with a sales pitch but yeah go to patreon.com in any case though we thought it would be fun to catch up on the show because i just moved to evansville and we haven't had a chance to podcast together a lot so we thought we'd review all three episodes here for you now as this episode of sanity at the movies if you i feel like i should say though if you go to that patreon sorry folks i'm I'm laying a lot of pipe here at the top but if you go to that patreon you also get all of our clone wars reviews well not all of them we're in the like the we're on season three Jake? That sounds right. Maybe? Yeah, I know like I've watched the Southern Fried Gothic, uh, what's that hut that talks like Truman Capote? <laughs> I've watched that one. <laughs> Zero? Zero the hut, yeah. <laughs> I've watched that arc, which is really weird, but we have I don't think we've actually gotten a chance to talk about it. So It ties into some stuff with Cad Bane. Yes, 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 Cad Bane. So if people remember the- And Quinlan Voss, who gets referenced in the prequel trilogies. That's, shows up there. that's absolutely right. So I, I, this, we're, so, we're somewhere around there in terms of working our way through Clone Wars in great detail and having a lot of fun doing it. We also talked our way through Mandalorian season. We talked about Mandalorian season one back when it came out, but I think we, or I know we just finished talking about Mandalorian season, season two, two, episode by episode, episode by episode in depth, had a lot of fun doing that. So anyway, there you go. There's your pitch. Go to patreon.com, support a great podcast. But I haven't even, I'm such a avaracious, money-grubbing person. I, I've, I've started straight with the pitch by way of explanation before even introducing the snitch. 
<laughs> ben Sulcer, uh, <laughs> why'd you rat us out? Uh, I thought you meant because I'm like really fast and, you know, like the snitch and you have to try and catch up with me. Oh, like in, in the golden snitch. yeah, Like That's in Lord right. of the Rings. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what you meant, though. So I'm at a loss. Well, mm. I did it for the greater good boys. <laughs> <laughs> you dirty rat. <laughs> no, listen, folks. It's 2021. We don't, the show doesn't brook this kind of nonsense anymore. It's Ben Solzer, and he's not a snitch. He's my good friend, and he's here to talk about WandaVision with us. Yay. And Ben, I think you're going to be a fixture on this podcast starting now. Cool. We were all living in different cities and stuff like that. Well, that's not true. Like two of us were living in one city, I was living in a different city. Well, and just the freedom of schedules was very different. Yeah, it was very restricted. Now we can. Not have restricted schedules, which means Ben can join us on Sanity at the Movies, which I'm very happy about. Yeah. Ben, though, it's not just you and me. No. It's not just the nerd crew talking about their nerds. We've also got an athlete, a poet, a... (laughs) A goober. He's not a a nerd like us. He's not a goober like some people. We don't accept goobers. I I don't mean to be racist against goobers, but there's no goobers on these podcasts, folks. I don't know, Ben. Why don't you just introduce him? It's Jake. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Jake Menzel. That's me. Pastor who's a master of cinema. All right. You bet. And of Marvel. So guys. The small screen. Yeah. The the master of the small screen. We've all been watching WandaVision on our individual small screens. And three episodes have come out as of this recording. In our idyllic household lives. In our idyllic household lives. With our sitcom lives. With our sitcom (laughs) lives. Lives. I get home. I from work. I almost trip over that <laughs> Davenport every time. <laughs> you do a little somersault and pop right back up on your feet. And pop right back. Oh man! Then you turn on Wandavision and you start to feel like it's a little uneasy. Like, is there something wrong with my idyllic sitcom life? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But anyway, then you just go to the next episode. It's yeah, kind of how, <laughs> that's how fine. Is the Disney Corporation trying to <laughs> rot my brain? <laughs> And then you say, yes, it is. And you go to the next episode. Uh, It's WandaVision, guys. What did you think? We've all watched all three episodes, true or false? True. True. And uh, I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll talk through them in more, you know, depth. But big picture, what do we think? It's fun. I like it. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. I like it too. Enjoyable. I will be interested to see whether it picks up emotional resonance in such a way as it's the sort of thing that I would ever want to go back to. Or as if it's, you know, just a J.J. Abrams mystery box that we all like to make fun of now for some reason. Because uh, J.J. Abrams is dumb, I guess. But also, we all we, we all watched Lost. So I don't think we get to make fun of the mystery box. I didn't watch Lost. Okay, Ben, you can make fun of the mystery box. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a certain segment of the internet. People don't know what I'm talking about. J.J. Abrams gave this TED Talk where he was he talked about storytelling. And he talked about the mystery box. And that's his style of storytelling is you set up a bunch of mysteries like at the beginning of lost or at the beginning of the force awakens. the force awakens and then jj abrams i think even in that ted talk he's like it doesn't really matter what's in the box and you can definitely see that in his <laughs> storytelling because lost it's like they didn't know what they were doing they didn't have a bible for that show or, or if they did they wrote it after they developed all of the yeah mysteries source awakens obviously famously nobody had a clue where it was going and then other things like that stupid J.J. Uh, Abrams movie that I don't even remember the name of, the Spielberg Griff thing. Oh, uh, it's the kind of film, right? Yeah. Eight, mil- eight millimeter. No, that's no. a Nicolas Cage movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> <That's close. laughs> it's something like that. Uh, I liked, Twelve. I liked that movie. Twelve and a half. It was fun. Yeah, I didn't like that movie. <laughs> I don't like much of what J.J. Abrams does, and yet I will not allow people to... What is that thing called? I know, right? I will not allow people to make fun of the mystery box storytelling, because I think it's effective when done well. I never wanted to go back to that movie, but I did enjoy it. In Nine movie. and a half weeks? <laughs> no. <laughs> it has a number. It does have a number. 12 millimeter? Is it 12 something? I'm getting there. Got to get past 10 Cloverfield Lane. And I like the uh, dad in that movie. And the that Star actor. Trek stuff. It's cool. Super 8. Super 8. Yep. There you go. I had the 8 right. Yeah, you had the 8 right. I think you going 8 millimeter is probably what threw us off from getting it because it was so close that it was hard then to come back from that. So what am I saying? I'm saying people like to mock this kind of storytelling because it's 
proven to be dumb in a couple cases. X Files is another famous one where they strung you along with mysteries, secret smoking, secret, man. and it's like they never had anything up their sleeves that was <laughs> all that great. Stephen King is a famous author who, you know, the beginning of his books are always great, and then the endings always like. Uh, it was it was a monster from space, and you killed it with love or, or something. Which <laughs> <laughs> lost pretty much <laughs> stole that, you know. Uh, it was the forces of good and evil, and you fight them with love or something. So anyway, <laughs> we're all riffing on Bradbury. We're all Bradbury. we are. Yeah, I mean, honestly, what book that people haven't read and can't necessarily reference has had more cultural impact than something, something wicked, wicked. Is, this way comes i mean so many huh. horror supernatural stranger things kinds of things and it's because people like stephen king followed that formula and then everybody ripped off stephen king huh. but the uh madeline langle tried it yeah yeah, yeah. The, the uh the rosetta stone though is uh and succeeded <laughs> yes, it's, no, no, ben. no, no. She tried. She could not love the brain, but she could love Charles Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Ah, <laughs> uh, fondly remembered part of my childhood. Oh man, read and reread. Let a, me tell you, a fondly par- remembered part of my ch- my childhood, and a very ill remembered part of my adulthood. Uh, uh, reading that book, yeah. mm, ill on both counts in my experience i was gonna say opinion but so anyway though <laughs> both are true guys are true. guys stop getting us off track please uh, this podcast uh, you, i'm always trying to keep us on track and you guys are always derailing us so <laughs> Jake, we Jake. apologize <laughs> i apologize kind of, kind of like wanda and wanda <laughs> yeah, kind of like wanda and wanda vision <laughs> so let me just rewind a little bit like wanda likes to do when she's not liking the way that her narrative's going finish my thought which is i'm not sure whether this puzzle box will be anything but like by the end of this, will be it be something that we actually want to go back to, or is this going to be just a fun kind of silly one-off? I mean, I'm sure there. I, I think it all it has to be is a fun, silly, engaging one-off that introduces the next phase of multiverse and mutants. Mm-hmm. And if it does that, and it's engaging and fun, like I'm looking forward to the next episode. Yeah, me too. I'm waiting for yeah. Friday. You know, and, and it. And it's even nice. It's nice that they're doing that to me. Like I remember. Oh, hey, this is like TV. I remember TV. I, yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. It's yeah. it's making you not just in some ways nostalgic for those shows. If it's making you nostalgic for the shows, it's making you nostalgic for the experience of TV. Like, so smart not to just drop this one in a Netflix style yeah. season. Mm. Yeah. No, it's it's part of it, and I I love that it's part of it. You know, it's just, yeah. I'm looking forward to, you know, yep. you know? We, we can all gather around the water cooler and talk <laughs> about the latest stuff from. For a whole week, we'll talk about the. And speculate and yeah, it's fun. I think the experience that a lot of people had like that uh, of recent cultural memory was Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones but of course, right. we are moral individuals or strive to we be. Therefore did not participate. In therefore it. did not participate on it, in it. But I don't know any, any other big picture kind of thoughts that you guys have about this this bad boy i think it's fun to ha- it's fun to have episodes of marvel it is it, it almost makes you wish they would just do like the avengers tv show or something like that like instead of movies these characters belong almost on the small screen well it allows you to i mean if you think of just like the the uh, quality of one division mm-hmm. versus the quality of say thor the dark world or just the very first Thor, uh, Captain America, First Avenger, yeah. some of those initial phase one films, like they could have set up a lot of stuff that really made that first Avengers movie pay off. Maybe they couldn't have pulled it off then, but they can now. And they, I think they know that. And so it's like, okay, let's let's tell these storylines and really develop and enrich uh, these characters. Well, I'll give you the best example of a movie that I think has gained some cachet over time, but wasn't particularly well-received when it came out, and it does have its problems, but it also has its virtues, is Age of Ultron. Age of Ultron, absolutely. Which you probably knew I was going to say, because that would have made a perfect season, like eight-episode little season of TV where we developed all the little bunny trails and got to know Ultron and understand the threat and live with Tony's angst and all this all this stuff that we had to... And and by vision as a character, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's trying to do so much that when you when you went and saw it the first time, it was just like, man. And and then there was all this stuff that you knew had been cut and left on the cutting room floor. You could tell because you could see the seams of it all. And it was just like, it was too much, right? Mm-hmm. But you go back to it now and it's like, oh, oh, 
you know, Whedon laid a lot of stuff in here that they paid off later in other little ways. And and that's the kind of fun thing that that you really want. Right. Like, mm-hmm. you want there to be so many fun things. I think what Whedon didn't want to do was have another payoff movie. Right. He wanted to have a movie that also had setups. Mm-hmm. That was a an admirable idea. Mm-hmm. But he, he couldn't quite pull it off in the moment. But well, there's so many moments that are mm-hmm. that should land really hard in that movie, but they don't because you haven't had sufficient setup. But they're great payoffs in and of themselves. I mean, everything with Vision when he has stores to hammer is great. My audience applauded actually. Vision's you know the final little moment with Ultron. Well, I was born yesterday. I mean, that's a great moment, but. You haven't spent There's enough time with Vision and with Ultron for it to really yeah. connect it, it, the way it's supposed to. I mean... It plays better watching it now because you actually have spent time with Vision and you know these characters and you like Elizabeth Olsen a little bit. And It does play better if you're thinking of Vision as an evolved Jarvis who you've lived with throughout the Iron Man movies. Right. Yeah. And that... I certainly think that's how Whedon hoped it would hit. The best way to interpret that in the moment was... You can just think of this as Jarvis. Like we've been playing with Jarvis. Jarvis was there at the beginning. Jarvis has been there throughout the MCU. Jarvis was established as a threat to Vision early in this, or as a threat to Ultron early in this. Mm -hmm. Was Jarvis killed? But he wasn't, and he's been protecting us all. And now he's embodied, sort of. Which I think works. Not really Jarvis. It does work. Like I think this is like no skin off anybody's back. You have seven kids, which means you've watched these movies a lot more or or just had them on in the background. And and so you're like, oh, it's Jarvis. I've lived with this guy, this Jarvis. I think for me, Jarvis is like, oh yeah, I forgot. Paul Bettany was in these things. Like he's the one doing that voice. That was always kind of neat. He he was good at it. Yeah, he was good at it. And it was funny that the guy from Beautiful Mind and a bunch of stuff like that was doing this little thing. So it didn't really land. I I can imagine like when our patrons, another little plug here, folks, when you finally get us to, what is it? Like a thousand dollars a month or something or 750, whatever it is. And we go through the Marvel movies. I think all that stuff will play better with the context and with just noticing things that you know you're supposed to, like Jarvis. But Well, yeah, I mean, those movies always suffered from, they just wanted to be fun mm-hmm. and they didn't care about their details or consistency, but then they wanted to like pay off. So that they're communicating, don't, don't bother with the, these details here. Don't bother with these details here. And then when they have their big team movie, they're like, mining these other movies for details that they can try to Easter egg and pay off and stuff. And, and then they don't land Mm -hmm. unless you've like gone back to them a couple times and noticed and thought about them. And then it's like, okay, well, if you put forth the effort, then there's, there's more here than you think there is, but who's going to put forth that kind of effort? Marvel doesn't tell you that you should or set that expectation anyway. The argument for it, I think is they had two, they knew they had two kinds of fans. There was either me And it's like, I don't care enough to even care that I'm missing that stuff. That's probably something I should understand. I should probably remember about these stones, but also like I'm having fun. I'm enjoying the quips. I'm enjoying like I I care about them as movies and about as as, as kind of pop culture artifacts. But I just really am not that interested in the the minutia of the world. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people that really care, really care. And they're really into it. And you can trust them to have picked up on. 50 things that the filmmakers didn't even intend because they've read the things and they've yeah. watched it and they've poured over and they've analyzed the trailers and they've watched the commentaries. And mm-hmm. the, I don't know that there's actually how many people, maybe, maybe we actually, you know, I, I represented myself maybe a little bit too, too negative there. Maybe we are actually the weird middle ground people that they could reach by being like, Hey guys, you should probably pay attention to this, but not so much this, but how many of those people actually exist? who aren't doing podcasts or, or just invested with it. Like I didn't care about Marvel. I didn't care about Marvel movies. I didn't watch any of the phase one movies until Avengers came out. And then Avengers was big enough that I think I saw Avengers or, and went back or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then the, you know, the kids, they keep you engaged and coming back around and sucked in, I guess. So I, I only ever, initially engaged as just somebody who was like, oh, look, fun popcorn movies. Mm -hmm. This isn't all that bad. This isn't all that dorky. It's dorky in a way I like, actually. Yeah, well, there's so few movies that everybody can enjoy and kind of, you know, lowest common denominator where we can all kind of get behind this. So I think if I had a family, I would have probably watched these movies a thousand times just because 
Pretty they, easy. To they do. got a little something for everybody. And, yeah. You know, it's like Pixar for 12 year olds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess my only other kind of big thought about this is the pop culture pastiches that they're doing are the best I've ever seen. You all, I, we've seen this kind of thing. You know, this is not new territory. Let's make fun of the the cultural artifact that is the sitcom. Let's dwell. Like, isn't it weird that people laugh, you know, the laugh track, this isn't the first people to interrogate that text, but that 70s show. Yeah. That 70s show. Exactly. I think this is far and away the best recreation, the lighting, the sets, the really laugh feels, tracks. Yeah. Everything feels, I mean, and, and that's the fun thing about it they don't have to go back and try to recreate like you know stranger things is going to try to recreate the feel of something mm. spielberg and john carpenter and whatever else like this is just going to be like all right we're now in the 50s what's the quintessential dick van dyke i love lucy vibe right that we need to we're just going to do that once but like i i watch those things i mean i you know i am like the resident person of the three of us who has watched and absorbed the most dick van dyke show and thought the most about what the dick van joke dyke show is what is doing and why it's doing it and wh- which cameras it's using and it's like whenever i watch one of these kinds of things it's like they don't they're, you know like stranger things it doesn't look like it was shot in the 80s it looks like it was <laughs> shot in 2015 or whenever it was shot on digital cameras with yeah. new lighting and they're trying to make it look like it was in the 80s uh, i watched that movie the david fin- the new fincher movie which i liked a lot called mank which is a Citizen Kane. It's set in that era. It's about the making of Citizen Kane. And they do it intentionally in the style of Kane. And it's really cool the way that they evoke that, the way, you know, the sound starts out real grandiose. And then as the credits plays, it gets tinnier and tinnier and thinner and thinner until they've actually replicated old studio, crappy studio sound. They do things like that that are cool. But at the same time, again, it's like, I can tell this was shot on a digital camera. It's just, it's too clean. It's too this, it's too that. Yeah fine they're doing what they set out to do you know i don't think they're actually trying to make me think i'm watching citizen kane they're trying you know they're being successful but the one thing that they're not doing is actually just putting me back there yeah. and and this thing just does not miss a beat in terms of actually structurally cameras everything yeah the lighting the whatever treatments i mean i assume they shot this digitally but whatever treatments they do it's not overdone. They're not adding a bunch of grain and stuff to make it look, but but they're just really, yeah. somebody did their homework in terms of what those sitcoms feel like. Yeah, it's good. And then whenever you have the creepy moments, it breaks the flavor of uh, the, even the, like the shots. Oh, I love that like, moment. That was my favorite moment in all three, probably when the boss starts choking uh, yeah. and then yep. suddenly we're out of sitcom and we're just... We're in something else. We've been on the back of vision for the whole time because this, the cameras in our studio with mm-hmm. our studio audience can't see vision's face like we can't break that that wall but suddenly we break that and the moments that they choose to break that are really smart and the way that it develops so the first show essentially is dick van dyke it's completely studio bound and it's just you know it's it's shot on a stage and they have multiple stages and then we see them in kind of a bewitched kind of thing in the second episode suddenly they're outside and they're doing more things cinematically as they did as the sitcom developed and then suddenly we're doing a mostly shot after the fact with a laugh track added kind of Brady Bunch Mm -hmm. and each one of they just nail how those shows worked and it's pretty easy to glibly do a surface surface level interpretation of how those kinds of things work but to actually get into the guts of it and really just evoke it it's cool for a nerd like me but I think it also really does the show credit because it doesn't it makes it not feel glib it makes it makes it not feel smug. It makes it not feel like we were. It doesn't feel cynical. We're just mining the 20th century for the dumb things that dumb people thought were funny back then. If you if you don't see the detail in the the sweetness, I feel in the homages, you could just, just step it, put it on paper. Hey, what's getting traction is in what's been getting traction over the last 10 years are homages to genres and homages to decades. I know the perfect thing to do. Mm-hmm. Let's let's nail them all. all. Right. You know, instead of trying to capture the 80s, we're going to capture we're going to cherry pick from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 10s all the way up to present day. That looks like, you know, somebody in a room in a suit making a a business decision. Mm-hmm. Like we can't lose here. If we're doing Dick Van Dyke, if we're doing Bewitched, if we're doing The Brady Bunch, if we're doing cherry picking from each decade, we've got so much nostalgia around us here. 
Mm -hmm. in each episode. We can't lose. We don't have to do anything else. We got two A-list actors. We're going to let Elizabeth Olsen really flex her muscles here, moving from genre to genre. Paul Bettany's obviously awesome. Right. And so... He doesn't have to flex his muscles because he's just... He's just... A great actor. I mean, yeah. he's, he's he has muscles to spare. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. okay. So, so that that's it. It's clear, easy win on paper. But then, man, they do such a good job with with those things that I just... It makes you feel good. Well, and I think if you're going to subvert something, you have to do your homework and you have to show that you love that thing and that you understand that thing. It makes the subversion land so much better. You know, if, if you're just saying, oh, all sitcoms were dumb and I hate it when I scroll past Nick, Nick by Night, that's one kind of a show. And I, I think that's a show that feels pretty glib and smug. But if you say, I really love and I understand the mechanics of how that show, those shows work, how that comedy worked, how those actors acted, I, I've understood everything about it. And I've re- lovingly replicated it. And then I'm going to ask, what was off about that? What was eerie about that? What was weird about that? What was false about that? That's just a much better way to go about mm-hmm. doing that kind of thing. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's like a person, like if, if Jake, Jake's counseling with someone as a pastor, that he wants that person to know that he loves them before he asks I've understood you. I've heard you. I love you. I've entered into your problems. And, and now here's why you suck. Yeah. That's much different than just like, up. ah, you suck. I assume you suck. I'm better than you. This show starts by being loving. And then when the, when the laugh track is wrong, it's like, oh, well, actually the laugh track was wrong in a lot of those shows. Actually, the audience was telling us things that weren't true. Actually, those producers were liars. You, you begin to think about those things and you begin to process them in a way that I think is much deeper and much better. I mean, this show is not like great art or anything like that. No, but in no, terms but of the small thing that it's doing, I think it's doing it well insofar as it's doing it thoroughly and with love. Well, in, in that sense, you know, what it is doing is it's asking you to think about the creator of this world, mm-hmm. right? And so it's, it's just that sort of like, it's got a whole lot of meta things going on mm-hmm. in it, right? So if it's asking you to say what was wrong about or off, just ever so off about the Dick Van Dyke show and its creators, well, it's also in the way that was all set up and the way, you know, the laugh, laugh tracks and all that it lined up or w- wasn't quite telling the truth. Well, what's... What does Wanda love about this that she she's either creating it or that it's been being used against her? Yeah. Who's the creator of this show that we're watching here? Who's the creator of this reality or alternate reality or whatever we're in? And what's going on with them? And that's the mystery in the mystery box that we're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. And so... But it feels fair. Yeah, it does. It, it feels very fair trying to think what the best way to do well i don't know do you guys want to talk about the mystery box do we have sure. do we have theories do you have a theory oh, yeah. ben you want to oh, offer yeah. you, what's your theory sure. i think this show is named wandavision because it's wanda's vision i mean i guess that's just duh but at this point i think by episode three you're like you understand that whatever anyone else's involvement is wanda wants it this way yeah and and that's real even if she's somehow someone could be deceived using that against her yeah. or yeah and, and they and they might be and i'm not i wouldn't be surprised if they are but it is what she wants she wants this little hermetically sealed world that she's gotten and she's going to have it and if something from the outside which she can vaguely understand or remember starts to threaten it she'll rewind the tape and recreate her vision and expel anything that tries to break in that's right mm-hmm. and the people that seem to be on her side are the people that want to subtly actually break that reality what's the black lady's name geraldine geraldine right uh, we know that that's monica rambo who's who is the daughter from uh captain marvel which i have never seen oh interesting like the the little girl the little girl from cap from captain marvel that's who that's supposed to be yeah interesting Hmm. so cool yeah, I mean, unless they're doing a bait and switch, this would seem to be Wanda's vision. I mean, I don't know that I disagree with, or I don't disagree with anything. Do you have? Uh, I mean, you know, it, there's all kinds of different ways it could go. Still, in my mind, you know, the the only real interesting thing is Wanda's the bad guy here. You know, it could be any number of other. So Agnes is interesting as a character. Little things, you know, the devil's in the details, and that's not all he's in. Mm-hmm. Little things that are thrown off. Ralph is her husband, and he's the only character that's been talked about. That, but not seen. Mm-hmm. But not seen. Yeah. Um, that's also such a sitcom. You know, Niles was always talking about Maris or whatever his wife was. And for, there's, there's always that character off screen, the, the, <laughs> the annoying wife or 
yeah, domineering but, boss or whoever it is that we talk about, but we don't actually see. Which is a fun trope to also have something scary be behind, mm-hmm. yeah. potentially. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like Wanda's controlling a whole lot of what's going on here, if not everything. Mm-hmm. Certainly people think that this is being done to Wanda mm-hmm. and they're trying to rescue her. Well, and the show is trying so hard to give you to lay those breadcrumbs for you that you almost want to say, uh, uh, I think maybe she has more agency than <laughs> you're pretending when you show us this military compound. And, right. Yeah, and yeah. When, when you have the guy bust through the radio and say, mm-hmm. Wanda, who's, who's doing, doing this, this to, to you? you? Wanda? <laughs> Wanda. That, that seems like a little bit of a red herring, you know? Yeah. Is it Wanda, comma, who's doing this to you or Wanda, who's doing this to you? Yeah, <laughs> um, that's what it would be if it was J.J. Abrams. <laughs> Shades of you mean it. apostrophe? But. Uh, apostrophe. Yeah, uh, I think that's where snob Nathan wants to rear his ugly head and say, "Is there really going to be anything all that interesting in this mystery box?" I mean, ultimately, is narratively, can it be that much more interesting than it was all a dream? Maybe agree to process her grief. I mean, sure, there's a bad guy, whatever, but ultimately, is there anywhere we can go with this besides just? Well, I mean, so Scarlet Witch. Uh, has kind of weird undefined powers and age of Ultron plays around with like, Oh, she can mess with Tony Stark's thoughts and show him a vision. And then promptly forgets all about that thing that she can Mm -hmm. do in people's minds for a number of movies. And she's just like telekinetic. Right. Mm -hmm. But this movie is more like returning to the comic book roots. It seems, which is she has, she's very powerful and she can manipulate reality right in some way that's not it's not entirely clear what the limits are her powers come from the my uh, reality stone mm-hmm. okay yeah well see there's it's like in some comic book timelines she's a mutant in some right. she was brought up to think she's a mutant and she's just a sorceress and then we have her powers come from the reality stone which is at least the accepted MCU canon if Baron von Strucker was using Loki's Scepter, mm-hmm. Loki Scepter had the powers of the reality stone. It's interesting that the and only that's reason why. that's canon is because right. they didn't have X-Men and now they do. And now they do. And now yeah. it feels like maybe part of what we're actually doing is setting up a retcon. Mm-hmm. Right. Her parents died or did they? You know, I, I saw somewhere that in at least one timeline or one comic book series, Magneto's her dad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. So that's you've right. got that sort of thing. Like maybe Strucker thought he, you know, all the other experiments on other children failed mm-hmm. uh-huh. why is that right mm-hmm. maybe he didn't give them their powers with the reality stone brought out maybe it brought them out because they were right. mutants maybe, yeah yep yep maybe it maybe it pretty know, easy to do a it, clean fix there if well, you want exactly and then introduce you know x-men and mutants and mm-hmm. that whole right that whole thing mm-hmm. well it feels more like the comic books to me because it's like oh we're gonna start retconning things a little more seriously because we can go we can do it episode by episode Mm -hmm. and we can explain we have lots of time to explain things to you well uh, very comic book marvel kevin feige i think as a creator i i bet i bet he in his most personal moments he would admit this probably wouldn't just do it in an interview or something but seems like he's pretty willing to re- to rely on the short attention spans of oh yeah i mean how many times did tony stark have the same arc in, in Ultron, like, he overcomes one thing, and then in Iron Man 3, I don't remember which one comes first, but Iron Tony Man Stark 3. essentially has the same arc, like, two or three times, just in the MCU yeah. proper. They just don't care. They know that, Marvel knows that it has an audience that is just there for the fun at the end of the day. And so you can have Thor Ragnarok, where Thor loses his hammer and realizes that, you know, the power was in him all along. And yeah, that's the best example. He doesn't need a hammer. And now he's whole and he's dealt with all of his family issues and drama. And now he's powered up to the next level and ready to go as awesome as Thor has ever been. And then, oh, the next thing we know, he sucks and he <laughs> needs a nut. He, he, his hammer is gone and he needs a our whole b plot now, now he needs is, gotta a, get that hammer now he needs an axe mm. and oh, now he's broken and fat and <laughs> just a big lebowski riff because we needed some comedic relief because we're going to kill tony stark yeah i mean i think like, that that's some of that speech some of the carelessness with the, which that's done is exacerbated by the fact that they really didn't know what to do with thor and they want it they hard swerved away from Branagh's interpretation into, I can never say that guy's name. Taika. The New Zealander. Waititi. Uh, yeah, Taika Waititi's thing, which is which is just fine. I don't care about Taika's, I liked everything, not everything, but I like 
Well, I do like pretty much everything they did with Thor in, in Ragnarok. Yeah, I don't like... That's hard- one of my favorite, I can rewatch this Marvel movies. Yeah, hmm. I, don't, I don't like what they did with Thor hardly at all in Endgame and Infinity War. No, it's terrible. But... But well, we've but talked I also about just, that at length. Yeah, and also I, just, I don't care. We've, we've litigated. Yes, folks, this is my new word. We <laughs> like to litigate things on the podcast. Or actually, usually when I say it, I say, we don't need to litigate that right now. But let's keep litigating. So well, I, I was going to say, see, this is where my, like, I'm actually not enough of a comic book geek mm-hmm. to know exactly what I'm talking but about. But I think you got us both beats. Yeah, you're enough. So, you're just enough. I, so, I know not, if I know anything, it's because I picked up some something on, you know, Facebook Right or whatever through uh, through an article at me and with the title and I read the title. Mm-hmm. Right. What if Wanda is actually Magneto's daughter and <laughs> mm-hmm. well, or or what if Wanda's the daughter of this famous X Men character and then you click on the comments so you don't have to read the article and they're like yep. Magneto. Yeah, we all know that that this was a thing and man, so, I, w- I would love it if they would bring Fastbenders. Magneto, but he was just well, cast. Who was I mean, Fastbender? Don't you? I, I dropped you it serious? in Slack. Oh, I didn't see oh, it. I didn't no. it too. Didn't I? What was Fastbender cast oh, as? Oh wait, no. Doctor Doom. You're right. That's right. Oh, I forgot though. But well, so, I'll watch Fastbender's so, anything. His Doctor Doom will be so, good. Yes, I do remember so, that. So now. real quick, I was just going to say, you know, in, in correlation with the multiverse thing, mm-hmm. there is like a long set of comic book arcs where the whole Marvel universe becomes something different because Wanda goes nuts. Mm-hmm. Same with Doctor Strange, which right. this is all the lead in. This is like the prequel to yeah. Doctor Strange into the multiverse of madness, well, right? It, it, exactly. And we already know that Spider Man's going to be nuts. So, so is this you guys' argument for why this actually isn't a dream? If this actually is. That's right. I'm oh sure. yeah, no, it's not a dream. It's going to have massive. This is the yeah. thing that has massive consequences for everybody and everything moving forward. Well, and, and I guess I guess the question is, how good a job are they going to do? Of because you you can do this kind of thing actually. And have it be fun and emotionally resonant. Mm-hmm. Or you can do it and have it be totally like a lame excuse. Right. Like, eh, you just undid all the emotional work. Right. I gone. mean, I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of this season, this would be the cool thing. This would be the like, John Favreau says, screw it, we're bringing Luke Skywalker into this. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, we're just going to do the awesome thing. Mm-hmm. By the end of this season, we've got Doctor Strange and we've got Patrick Stewart's Magneto, Ma- or uh, sorry, uh, Professor X. <laughs> Professor X showing up, and we've got like the, the multiverse is broken loose, and some of these characters that are going to cameo in, or that we know are going to be in Spider Man, mm-hmm. or the types of characters that would right. be in weird crossover type situations are just going to show up. I, I am very sure that that is what is going to happen one way. I, I, mean, I don't know whether it'll be that cool, but Bettany's talked about there's a big name actor that. We haven't announced yet. That was really fun to work with, and yeah. as he, I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think bet it's it was, Patrick Stewart. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't shock me at all. Or Ian McKellen. Or Ian McKellen. But but you already know mm-hmm. that they're going to have the uh, Fox X Men Quicksilver. That they cast Evan Peters, who's the Quicksilver, oh, and Brian. Which Sanders. is which is the best part of those Twi- Quicksilver yeah. and those X Men movies slaps. Yeah, yeah he's amazing. Yeah, no. Has Jake seen that scene yet? I haven't seen any of okay, the. Okay, after this, we'll have to show you the one. The one good scene from. Yeah. From, uh, X- Days of Future Past is a good movie. It's actually. okay. It's, yeah. it's, it's not the best. Watch it again, I saw. I, I tried to. I thought there was a time when we didn't have anything to watch, and I thought, I know, I'll go and try to do the X Men stuff. And I watched the first one. I was like, yeah, nope, nope. Oh no, interested. that if that I, that's. I like the first X Men. Well, for its time, it works dramatically. It went because Hugh Jackman. When you saw the first X Men, that although it was like, oh, somebody did it. Which is a nice feeling, but for Jake to go back after a million people have done no, it better. No, no. It's it's not a good action movie, and it wasn't when it came out. But what it is, is a decent, like, emotionally resonant movie with, at least, it has one thing. Yeah. But I... Eh. But I don't think that there's any reason that, to be surprised that it wouldn't hit that hard for Jake no. watching it 20 years down the road. I did, yeah, I just didn't feel... It was, it was sort of like... Uh, when I tried to watch Firefly, it was like, okay, I, I understand why people thought this was cool when it came out, but also yeah. I don't really need this. And so I'm not. Yeah. Firefly was a nice promise, but if you have the Mandalorian in your life, you can just watch the Mandalorian and you get all that. Yeah. <sighs> um, you, know, you want to throw some love at Firefly? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't care about Firefly. I don't anymore. care about Firefly. I just, back in the day I did, and it did some fun character stuff, but I, I, would I do not want to see it ever again? 
Abrams and Whedon are both good at the same thing, which is getting together a really good cast, making sure that they have a really good chemistry Mm -hmm. and having them play off of each other nicely. And Firefly did that just like Force Awakens did that. And it's really nice in both properties and goes a long way towards making them work. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know that I have any other big theories about where things are going. What else do you guys want to talk about with this stuff? Can we talk about how awesome? I mean, I just think Bettany and Olsen are both knocking it out of the park. It's really fun. Yeah. Just on a, it's one of those places where I like being an adult, actually. I don't actually just want to, I don't want to be so involved in the story. I, I want to take a step back and appreciate what these people are doing yeah. as actors. And the way that they're able to play the different levels of, you know, just play straight sitcom and do a pretty good job at it, which again, mm-hmm. easy thing to do superficially, easy thing to do smugly, easy thing to do guilt gl- goodly, incre- incredibly hard to actually do what Mary Tyler Moore, what Dick Van Dyke, mm-hmm. what Lucille Ball, these geniuses did. did. And do it sincerely. And do it sincerely. And that's the thing. And that, not play down to it, but just play it. Yeah, that's the thing that like, I don't care to talk about Bettany because he's awesome and he's he's just awesome. And that doesn't surprise me. But Elizabeth Olsen, from the very first episode, I just didn't know that she had those kinds of chops. Like, I didn't know that that was in her. I didn't know that she could pull that off that well. Well, I'm sure I'm the the billionth person to point this out, but it's fun that she grew up in that milieu, no doubt, with her big sisters right? being on a sitcom. She probably actually has the rhythms in her bones. More than more than a lot of people. Well, it's fun that would. she gets to be the TV star now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the sitcom star. That's funny. But if she grew up watching those things, and if she's seen every Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen or whatever those specials, like she actually probably does understand sitcom rhythm, which I think it is. It is. It is, it is a musical thing. It's something that somebody like Marty McFly, whatever his name is, Michael just J. just Fox. just has. You yeah. know, or, or even somebody that I don't like, like Al Bundy, whatever that actor's name is. There's people who just understand the music of how to make that kind of stuff really pop and work. And then there's people where you're like, what are you doing? And the fact that Elizabeth Olsen can do that, but also bring some additional emotional resonance to it in just the right places. The way that she modulates her accent is really good. I mean, she has claimed that every step of her accent has been very intentional. Uh, it feels if you're watching it like they just said, "Oh, that Russian accent was dumb. Let's let's get rid of that as quickly, incredibly as we can." But she actually does subtly shift her accent a little bit depending yeah, on on what's required of her mm-hmm. in this. Well, and yeah, and even yeah, she breaks into re- that sort of well, Sokovian mm-hmm. or or tilts subtly towards a Sokovian, just little moments. Yeah, it's not that she actually breaks into it; she just indicates that she could or that she almost did or yeah there's something going on inside as things get crazier in that third episode you sort of feel it sort of wanting to break through it at various points and again like what's cool what's cool about that is elizabeth olsen that's not something she would slip into Mm -hmm. that's something Mm -hmm. that she has to put on or pull in Mm -hmm. that's fun yeah she's working hard she's working hard at every turn and it's kind of, I mean, people love this show. They love her in it. So I guess it's not a thankless work, but it is thankless. And so far as there are not going to be a lot of eight-year-olds watching this thing who are going to notice the fine nuance. She's probably not going to win an Emmy for this. You know, it's, it's not flashy what she's doing. It's, I hope she does. I, I hope she does too, but I'd be a little surprised, you know, because she's not shouting. She's not crying. You know, she'll probably get to do a lot, some, some good shouting and crying. She's going to have, she's going to have to have. A big emotional moment before this is all over. Oh yeah, I mean, do we all agree that this is this is this is like the morning vision arc, right? I mean, yes, this is that's that's what this is really going to be about, one way. <laughs> yeah, but what's yeah. or bringing him back, I guess. But either way, it's, it's the I emotions. It's possible that he could be brought back, but maybe, yeah, it's weird. It is. It is weird. What I like about what I like is in episode three where you have that sudden shift where you realize, wait a minute. Actually, she's kind of scary, and there's just that feeling of menace, Mm -hmm. and you're like, wait a minute, oh, that would be awful if you started to figure out who her power is and she didn't like you. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't wouldn't shock me if we realized that all these people are there to help her, and 
they're trying to help her against herself you know like yeah. she's her own greatest enemy and so she actually does pose a threat to geraldine and to mm-hmm. i mean we're ladling on the menace with some of these characters so much that it just seems the rule of storytelling says they must be good guys yeah i mean geraldine's an outsider in a way that agnes mm-hmm. and uh, herb and herb and some others aren't yeah mm-hmm. the geraldine episode so we know that she's daughter of a pilot mm-hmm. and that episode begins with you know, some something weird is trying to break into this, you know, the banging on the mm-hmm. on the whatever things people are trying to break in, something from the outside is trying to break in. And then we get the helicopter, the the Iron hmm. Man colored helicopter hmm. with the sword logo in as a toy in the bushes. And now we have a new character that just showed up with mm-hmm. what's the sword logo? So it's it's a logo that uh, with a sword on it that oh i, I thought you, that you knew what it what organization it, it it's something sure. like sentient weapons oh yeah okay sentient weapons so that's from captain marvel which i'm still right no i, I think it's i think it's like the replacement for shield hmm. uh, okay. so geraldine's wearing a sword logo uh there's a sword logo on the helicopter and it pops uh, there's a sword logo on the beekeeper so the that sword logo thing keeps popping up in different places, and it's in the context of everybody who's trying to break in to this world. But then there are other people that seem like they're more a natural part of it. Like they've got homes, they've got places, they've got mm-hmm. right a a backstory. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. I, before we get away from the performances, I do want to throw some love at Paul Bettany. A because I think he's great, but one thing that I just always like about Paul Bettany is that he seems like one of those performers that's pretty humble. Like he's just there to serve the project. I think they're both being humble and not playing particularly flashy parts. And presumably both of them will have some meaty dramatic stuff to do later on. But what's fun about what Bettany's doing and what's especially humble about it, I think is he's playing the, what's the guy's name from bewitched. I don't even know. There's Samantha and then there's John or John or Dick or Derek and, the actor was famously replaced halfway through the and show nobody and noticed. nobody noticed or cared. <laughs> <laughs> the guy had a drinking problem or something like that. Yeah. So Bettany playing the square lame, obviously it's the, you know, if this was a sitcom, it would be like the Elizabeth Olsen sitcom. And then Bettany's the dude in the sitcom, just the foil, just the foil. And he plays that so well. And he doesn't seem to need to, draw attention to himself you know i mean for a guy of that caliber a guy who can be so great a guy who can be you know in master and commander or whatever who can bring so much life and verve and intelligence to a role it's just always fun to see how he slides into these things another really good example actually is solo where it's such a dumb nothing part that he has to play but he's just there to play the gangster in the it's like the most fun part it is it is it is a fun part but it's the movie's not doing anything fun with it. No. He'll be back in Obi-Wan. Yeah. Well, we can only hope. But, well, didn't... Cur- I, I, I like this character. Didn't Dragon Princess kill him? She did. Oh, yeah. That's right. Well, Depending well on we don't know... The timeline. He might be yeah, back. Yeah, necessarily the timeline. But, yeah. I just like Paul Bettany. And I like him here. And I like his hair in that... In the 70s one. <laughs> Bring back 70s fashion. Well... Is there anything else to say about this? Credit sequence, super fun. The little, I don't know. It's just, it's really fun how they create the world Mm -hmm. in 30 seconds. Like a good credit sequence is supposed to. And then, oh yeah, the little random animation in the second episode. Yeah, okay. the gum. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, because they, they do such subtle loving work in most of the places, the places where they are just like, it's a sitcom. Weren't old sitcoms silly? You know, wasn't TV funny back then really land, I think, better than they would otherwise, once again? I mean, I could just see such a smarmy version where everything is just that, just right. like little birdies flying around their heads and, you know, innocent people who liked silly things were dumb, but <laughs> that's not <laughs> what this is. I'm digging all the creepy stuff, too. Oh, yeah. There's, creepy it's, stuff is great. Yeah, it's very, like almost david lynch or something that beekeeper scene oh, and stuff yeah beekeeper. just like the they they managed to get some real the underlying evils breaking into pleasant everyday suburbia kind of <laughs> feeling yeah. it's nicely done 
The only other show that I can think to compare this to actually is one that I would not recommend anyone watch. And I only watched the first season, but, uh, Legion, ah, yes, which Legion. was, which was, was an X-Men, he's an X-Men character or something is, like yeah, that. And it was, right. I think it was set. He's Xavier's son. That's right. Yep. And that show kind of did something a little bit similar, but yeah, that it, show is awesome. But it ladled yeah, on much more gross. perversity than this did. So. And season two became for me unwatchably gross. Yes, I turned it off in season two as well. Unwatchably gross and unwatchably in a uh, in its head about yeah, the things no that kidding. it was doing. It would be like if you took the pop culture riffs that this one's doing and doubled it or tripled it and added a bunch of esoteric sixties references and and had some narrator talking about the philosophy of what was going on kind of yeah this is like the the pg kids version of that which is a lot more fun a lot more fun and better well folks those are our thoughts on wandavision it's a fun show yeah ben how many visions out of 12 do you give this show uh, so, so so far, so far, I give it ten and a half. High praise, maybe eleven. Wow. Oh, just because wow. it's it's fun and it doesn't seem to be asking me to do anything else but have fun. Typical Marvel in that sense. Yep. Well, and it is so nice that, and I, I'm not the first person to point this out, but that they didn't just give us it's another villain and our superheroes need to fight him and stuff. Well, don't worry, you'll get that soon with that crummy looking winter soldier falcon show that doesn't look good does it no it looks mm-hmm. terrible i agree it looks like garbage well and, and it's so smart to start with this because that stuff you do something like that out of the gate it's like well that couldn't really compete with Fully. the million billion dollar <laughs> movies that we're making the problem with that show is it looks like that's what it wants to be mm-hmm. like a miniature version of a million billion dollar movie yeah it looks like it's just failing to be that whereas yeah. this show isn't even playing in the same ballpark and presumably when they get to the big special effects stuff towards the end of this show We'll have waited long enough and be hungry enough for it and it'll tie in well enough that we just won't care. That'd be nice. Whether it's not quite as epic as, you know, the CGI budget of Endgame or something like that. Jake, mm-hmm. how many Wanda's out of 12? Visions out of 12? I was going to give it 10, but I feel like I have to come in higher than Ben, so I'm going to give it 11. <laughs> huh. Well, I feel like I have to come in lower. If we're, if we're all playing to type, then <laughs> I'll give it nine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it nine. I'll give it ten, but I will say, depending on where it goes, it, we could be bumping down to oh, yeah. seven or eight, yeah. or, or we could be going up to twelve if they stick the landing yep. somehow. Yep, you we know, just don't know yet. If they really do something that's really cool and interesting and emotional, then this could be, you know, not just a fun show, but a great show. But we just don't know yet. I will. Okay, there, so here's one other thought that I just randomly thought of. I, I will. The one comment that I did text to Jake was. This is such a loving, perfect pastiche. Why not write some jokes? <laughs> like the Dick Van Dyke show actually did have legitimately good, well-crafted jokes. And this show has some of them, but not as many as a real sitcom would. That's a good point. Of that. And by the time we get to Brady Bunch, I think that's actually fair because you watch the Brady Bunch and you're like, oh, this laugh track really is just lying to us. Like there's no jokes. There's just the rhythm of jokes and a laugh track. But something like, the Dick Van, the, the first episode is specifically, I think the writing should have probably been a little sharper than it was. Yeah, so. I, I think the second episode felt like it might have earned the most jokes or something. Yeah, the second episode had the whole magician thing, yeah. which felt so much like a bewitched plot or, uh, you know, one of those mm-hmm. shows that goes into the kind of farcical. I mean, the the hero accidentally gets drunk or had, now it would be like pot brownies or something like that and, and then has to do a presentation or something. That's just such a classic sitcom thing. And they did a pretty respectable version of that. Okay, so let's see. We've all rated this sucker. We're going to be reviewing the individual episodes over at patreon.com for... Uh, what is it? What's the URL for our thing? Patreon.com. Forward slash sanity at the movies. That's right. So go there if you want to hear more WandaVision thoughts. And, you know, we'll probably check in on this side of Patreon just as, like, if we're like, oh, no, you should never watch this show. It was dumb of us to recommend it. You know, we'll, we'll let you know. But, or if we're like, it's a masterpiece, maybe we'll tell you that. But if you want more details and want to go on the journey with us, then Patreon is the place to do it. All right, folks, we'll be back to review more movies on Sanity at the Movies. Until next time. 
The devil's in the details, but that's not all he's in. Mm, deep stuff. Deep, deep, 